Good morning. Yes, good morning. That's it. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to our Sunday worship service today. It is very good to see you. And uh, if you're visiting us for the first time, a uh, very uh, warm welcome to you as well. And also to those who will be watching the service online and uh, later on. Uh, our call to worship is taken from Psalm 98. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm are worth salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. Uh, we sing our opening hymn as we worship God 459, cry with him with many crimes. It was King David who, confessing his failure to God by committing a heinous sin, in Psalm 51 said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your free spirit. Our gracious and eternal God, as we gather for worship this morning, Give us that inner sense of peace that we may give you the worship that you alone deserve. We pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom to make some sense out of the many perplexities of life. That give us the strength to face the weak, the future which lies ahead, 
And give us, dear Lord, the humility we need to confess our failures, to confess the many faults, the many sins that we have committed voluntarily or even inadvertently. And yet, dear Lord, we thank you that there is grace sufficient to cover all our sins to those who truly repent. We marvel at the wonderful love that we find in Christ our Savior. We are truly deeply humbled to know that in Him we are truly forgiven. We thank you that you who are the God of all things, the Creator and the Giver of all life, the one who sustains the world, the one who upholds our lives, is the very one, the same one, who takes an interest on your children. And so, dear Lord, we come before you this morning and we confess that at times we have not loved you or our neighbor as we should. Too often we have taken perhaps the easy way rather than your way, and thus we have grieved your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you will teach us Teach us to see that we are bought with the price of Jesus' death upon the cross, a price we could never repay, and yet what a wonderful gift which is freely received. So be with us this morning. May everything that we do, everything that we say, be all done to the praise and the glory of your holy name. Be with those who are bowed before you. Be with those, dear Lord, who the families that we represent that perhaps can be with us today. Lord, grant us your blessing, and may you draw us near to you and to one another through the bonds of peace and through the Holy Spirit, which you have bestowed upon us. So bless our service now, and hear these our prayers as we bring them in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And before we hear the readings for this morning's uh, service, we once again turn to our hymn book. And hymn 139, that Jesus' love is very wonderful. 139. from the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, and it's Psalm 30. 
be found around or on page 552 in the Bibles. A prayer of thanksgiving. I praise you, Lord, because you have saved me and kept my enemies from gloating over me. I cried to you for help, O Lord my God, and you healed me. You kept me from the grave. I was on my way to the depths below, but you restored my life. Sing praise to the Lord, all his faithful people. Remember that the Holy One has done, and give him thanks. His anger lasts only a moment, his goodness lasts for a lifetime. Tears may flow in the night, but joy comes in the morning. I felt secure and said to myself, I will never be defeated. You were good to me, Lord. You protected me like a mountain fortress. But then you hid yourself from me, and I was afraid. I called to you, Lord. I begged for your help. What will you gain from my death? What profit from me going to the grave? Are dead people able to praise you? Can they proclaim your unfailing goodness? Hear me, Lord, and be merciful. Help me, Lord. You have changed my sadness into a joyful dance. You have taken away my sorrow and surrounded me with joy. So I will not be silent. I will sing praise to you, Lord. You are my God. I will give you thanks forever. And before uh, Bruce uh, reads to us uh, the second reading from the Gospel of John, uh, we are going to see once again, uh, 509, Jesus calls us. John, it's on chapter 21, verses 1 to 19, to be found on or around page 145 in the Pew Bible. Jesus appears to seven disciples. After this, Jesus appeared once more to his disciples at Lake Tiberias. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel, the one from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples of Jesus were all together. Simon Peter said to the others, I am going fishing. We will come with you, they told him. So they went out in a boat, but all that night they did not catch a thing. As the sun was rising, Jesus stood at the water's edge, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then he asked them, Young men, haven't you caught anything? Not a thing, they answered. He said to them, Throw your net out on the right side of the boat, and you will catch some. So they threw the net out, 
and could not pull it back in because they had caught so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him, for he had taken his clothes off and jumped into the water. The other disciples came to shore in the boat, pulling the net full of fish. They were not very far from land, about a hundred meters away. When they stepped ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and some bread. Then Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net ashore full of big fish, 153 in all. Even though there were so many, still the net did not tear. Jesus said to them, Come and eat. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. So Jesus went over, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This, then, was the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from death. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Yes, Lord, he answered, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he answered, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? So he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. I'm telling you the truth. When you were young, you used to get ready and go anywhere you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will bind you and take you where you don't want to go. In saying this, Jesus was indicating the way in which Peter would die and bring glory to God. Then Jesus said to him, follow me. May God add his blessing to this, the reading of his holy word, and to his name be the praise and glory, now and forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we do not live by bread alone. Let the heavenly food from the scriptures we are about to hear nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Bless this your word and us your people through Jesus Christ, who is the bread of heaven. Amen. The true story is told of a 15 year old teenager who stood guiltily before the headmaster of a Munich in, Ber in Germany school who was reading the riot acts to him. The boy was sadly reprimanded for lack of interest in his studies and he was asked to leave school. The headmaster said to him, your presence in the class destroys the respect of the students. The boy took an examination to enter the Swiss Federal Polytechnic School in Zurich, but he failed to pass. He entered another school, then finished his training, and then applied for an, assi an assistantship at the Polytechnic. Again, he was rejected. This continued for some time. Eventually, some years later, he succeeded to secure a position as a tutor for boys in a boarding house. But soon, he was dismissed. Finally, he managed to obtain a job in a patent office in Bonn, again Germany. This 15-year-old boy who grew, uh, who grew to be an, uh, an adult was none other than Albert Einstein. Undoubtedly, one of the cleverest men who ever lived. And yet, he knew a fair share of failure. It is surprising, I know, but as Dr. Martha Lloyd-Jones, the great Welsh preacher and minister at Westminster 
a chapel in London very wisely said, the men who try to do something and fail are infinitely better than those who try to do nothing and succeed. Well, this morning, I want us to consider about the failure so shocking that even after 2,000 years later, we are talking about it. And that is the failure of Peter, the disciple of Jesus, who denied the Lord three times. Now, there are really two parts to Peter's story. First, his threefold denial. The night Jesus was arrested. But then secondly, how Jesus forgave and restored Peter once again. The first part depends wholly on Peter, the man. The second depends totally and wholly on Jesus Christ, the Savior. Peter was in charge of his own failure. Christ took charge of restoring him and bringing him back to a right relationship once again. Now behind this story of Peter lies wonderful, liberating, and a hope-filled truth. And this is the truth. Failure is just an incident not a destination. It is not something that has to be inevitable or the outcome of your existence. And I believe that that, from a Christian point of view, is very good news for all of us because we all fail sooner or later. Some of us perhaps have failed, like Einstein, many times over. Nevertheless, failure does come knocking at the door of our lives. And if we are honest, we all fail repeatedly. As Peter's story abundantly proves, it's not our initial failure that ruins us. It's what happens next that matters. It's what we do in response of our failure. That is the real lesson. It is a matter of choice, if you ask me. Do we succumb to the consequences of failing and we feel sorry for ourselves? Or do we learn from it and become better men and women for Christ? That is the choice. Peter never forgot what happened the night when he denied Jesus. He never forgot it. How could he? Would you? <laughs> Would you forget it? Would I forget it? As long as he lived, Peter never forgot that terrible night. Tradition actually says that he would start weeping whenever he heard the rooster crow. It even goes as far as saying that he would even wake up every night and pray during the hour when he denied the Lord. It's only tradition, I know. There is nothing there in the Bible to tell us that actually happened. But I dare say, really, that maybe, just maybe, you couldn't blame him for thinking that or even for doing that. The question really that matters to you and to me today is, well, how does Jesus restore this fallen disciple? This is Peter we are talking about. This is not just one of the fringe disciples. This is one at the very core of Jesus' inner circle. Remember there were three? Peter, James, and John, they were the three ones, the inner circle ones. The one that Jesus confined to them. The one that Jesus took with them to get Gethsemane, to pray, or at least attempt to pray with them. But as we consider last week, or I can't remember when it was last week or the week before, they fell asleep. 
So this is the same man, this is Peter. Well, there are a number of answers, a number of stages here, faces, call it what you will, that really tells us how Jesus restored this fallen disciple. And the first thing that he does is that he sent for him. He sent for him. In the Gospel of Mark, we are told that when the women arrive at the tomb early on Sunday morning of Easter, an angel announced the good news and instructed them, and I quote, to go and tell the disciples and then and Peter. No other name is mentioned, but Peter's name certainly is. And that means something. That is important. What does that mean for his disciples and Peter? Well, Peter's denial has separated him from the other disciples. Oh, yes, the other disciples did a runner. <laughs> Peter did worse than a runner. He denied that he knew Jesus. Peter's denial has separated him. And no doubt he wondered to himself many a times, what am I now? Am I a traitor or am I a disciple? He felt shamed and remorse. His world, my friends, was in tatters. Peter may have failed in the upper room, remember? But Jesus sent for him. And this is more about Jesus than about Peter, really, when you think about it. Notice, the, notice Peter's stages of failure. Just a few hours earlier, Peter has said, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Remember John 13, verse 8? He then bragged about his courage. He bragged that if everyone else deserted Jesus, he would never do such a thing. Remember? How wrong he was. Oh, we are all full of good intentions. I'll do this and I'll do that and I'll be this and I'll be that. And when the truth or the time of truth and reality comes, then we, like Peter, often fail. Under pressure, the bold apostle melted away. And then Peter may have failed with Malchus. Remember Malchus? He was the servant that came to the Garden of Gethsemane. And, well, Peter, you know, he took a sword and he cut the ear of the man. I mean, you didn't want to mess with Peter, didn't you? I mean, you just would not do that. I mean, he was, he was quite a man with an intention on that night. Peter meant well, of course, he wanted to defend Jesus. But his futile attempt to protect Jesus accomplished absolutely nothing. Put your sword away, Jesus said to him. It must be this way. Don't you realize? I must be arrested. I must be condemned. I must be beaten. I must die. It has to be. And then Peter may have failed in the courtyard. And this is really what we remember Peter for. But nevertheless, we know Jesus sent for him in spite of that. Are you one of those men who were with Jesus? He was asked, Jesus? I don't know who he is. Another time, did you, didn't I see you with his disciples? Peter said, you must be mistaken. I, I, I don't really know the man, I promise you. Aren't you a follower of Jesus of Nazareth? And at that point, Peter becomes rattled. And I'm sure you have been rattled before when someone presses a sore point and you don't like what they're getting at you. And you react. Well, guess what he does? He begins to swear. I mean, you wouldn't do that, would you? But he did. Oh, yes, he did. He swore like a fisherman can swear. I tell you. Bleep, 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 bleep. I don't know that man. 
Can you relate to Peter? And at that moment, the Bible says, the rooster crowed, just as Jesus told him it would happen. And moments later, we are told that Jesus was brought out of, from his trial before the high priest Caiaphas. And in the Gospel of Luke, we are told, and it says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. No words were required. Just a look. And Peter knew right away. And that's when the full impact of his sin hit Peter between the eyes. He realized what he had done. Peter went outside and he wept. And the Bible says that he wept bitterly. Now, I don't know how good your imagination is. Mine utterly fails me. But that word bitterly ought to mean something to you and to me. Because if we realize that we have let Jesus down in us, we often do, sadly. That ought to hit us right in the heart. Because what we do to him is utterly agonizing, or at least they ought to be. But here is the grace and the wonder and the beauty of the grace of God. Because even though Peter did what he did, after his failure, the risen Christ sends for him. Tell the disciples and Peter. He doesn't write Peter off as a permanent failure. He doesn't put him in the biggest failure category. On the contrary, Jesus still has plans for Peter. Plans to give him hope. Plans to give him a future. Plans to give him a second chance. So here we see Peter's failure being dealt with by the Lord's love, mercy, forgiveness, and an ultimate plan for Peter. Peter, the failure will become the Apostle Peter, the great Apostle, the one who would in the end become a martyr, the one who preached on the day of Pentecost, his first ever, ever sermon, his first I remember the first time I ever asked to preach as 19-year-old lad. It only lasted for two minutes. So some people will be very happy. <laughs> two minutes. I couldn't say any more. Oh, no, Peter. On the day of Pentecost, he preached a mighty sermon. And guess how many people came to faith on one single day? One single sermon? 3,000, a quarter of Blegauri would have come to faith. Oh, what do I do to have this church filled to the rafters? Never mind 3,000, give me 200, maybe 500. Doesn't matter. This is the same man we are talking about. And this applies to all of us as well. Jesus gives us all a second chance. And I think we need to take note of that. But listen, secondly, what it does. Jesus restores Peter by meeting him one to one. We catch up with Simon Peter back in Galilee. And now we, we find Peter is fishing, but catching nothing. That's ironic, isn't it? <laughs> If you ask me, the same Peter who saw the empty tomb firsthand and encouraged the risen Christ in person is now back where he started fishing. I wonder what is it about the human personality that drives us into isolation when we miss the mark 
of our high calling. You know, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, when Adam ate the apple or the fruit of the tree, we are told that he went into hiding. Did you notice that? When God called Jonah, he, run, he runs right into the belly of a whale because he wanted to run away from God. When the prodigal finds himself feeding pigs and no one gives him anything, or even Peter here deals with his denial by going fishing. And not surprisingly, Peter did what most of us do when we really have failed big time. When we have made a huge mistake, the last thing we want is to be around other people, especially the ones who knows us best and often loves us the most. And having let down Jesus, Peter says, enough of this. I'm going back to my old profession. I'm going to go back and fish again. But you know, the irony of it all is that Jesus knew what Peter would do. Because we are told that Jesus from the shore, he was able to see what they were all doing. How many fish do you think they caught after fishing all night? You remember? None. What do you think that is telling you? <laughs> it's telling me one thing. Jesus would say, as he said before, without me, you can do nothing. My dear friend, even though you have failed Christ before, don't you think you can do better without him? You won't. You won't. I won't. None of us will. And so here we find Peter doing what he knew best and yet not being able to justify his expertise. And so here we find that Jesus wants to meet him one to one. And I think really this is such a wonderful example of the love of God that he has for us. Because Jesus actually wants to have a chat in a one-to-one -one with him. And my friends, is it not interesting that Jesus is not telling him off in public? He doesn't castigate him and tells him, I told you so. He doesn't. But rather, one-to-one, -one, he speaks with him by himself. And here we find the reason behind of that meeting. And this is the next thing that Jesus does. He challenged him. Now it is evening on the Sea of Galilee. And here we are told that Peter and six other disciples have spent the night fishing and they caught nothing, as I mentioned. But in the morning, a man calls from the shore, telling them to put their nets to the other side of the boat and they will catch fish. How dare that man tell us how to do our jobs? But he did, and actually it was successful. But why, why allow these men to toil for hours in frustration, we could ask? And the reason being is because failure in this case was the necessary prerequisite to eventually succeed and restore fellowship with God once again. And here we find Jesus challenging Peter one to one. And this is what it comes, and this is my last thing I want to mention this morning in response to this message of Peter. Jesus actually gives Peter a task. After breakfast, we are told, Peter and Jesus took a walk together. And this is the part of the story most of us know best. And I'm going to read it so that you are refreshed in your own mind. This is what it says. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than this? Meaning the other disciples. Okay. Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, 
take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now at that point, the Bible says that Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, and this is wonderful really, Lord, you know all things. Do you know that I love you? And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Notice that Peter and Jesus had this conversation around a charcoal fire. In verse 9, I want you to not miss that, that point. The Greek word for charcoal fire is used in only one other place in the New Testament. And that is in John 18, 18, to refer to the charcoal fire in the courtyard where Peter, I deny the Lord. Is the irony or is here the will of God being revealed in his beauty? By one fire, he says, I don't know him. By another fire, he says, Lord, you know I love you. By one fire, he denied Christ. By one charcoal fire, Christ restores him once again to a sweet fellowship. And you know, my friends, as I bring this message to a close, the question that Jesus asked him three times, and the reason why there were three questions three times is because Peter denied him three times. But the question really is simply this, do you love me? And my friends, if God in Christ this morning were to come to us and have a one-to-one -one with you and me sitting around a table, around a cup of coffee or tea, and Jesus was to talk to you and ask you the same question, do you love me? I wonder what you would say in response. Would you say, yes, Lord, I love you? And if you do, how do you prove that you love him? What would you do to prove that love for him? And that is a very personal response, I know. But the challenge is given to all of us. We cannot, we cannot hear those words of Jesus and says, do you love me? And not being able to say, Lord, you know all things and you know I love you. So my friends, let me just finish with this. What does Christ do with failure? The answer is, is that he redeems it, he restores it, he repays it, he buys it back, he rescues it. We love Peter because we can see ourselves in this story, for his story is our story. For all of us, the process of Christian growth is long and painful with many ups and downs. Peter the rock often seemed very unrock life or like. It took repeated failures to produce a rock solid character in him. But the wonderful thing, and this gives me so much hope, is that Jesus never gave up on him. Is that not wonderful? I mean, if we were in, a, in an African church, I would be hearing amens everywhere. But I know we are not in Africa. <laughs> but I would like you to at least be assured in your own heart to know that Christ has never given up on you. And that, I hope, will give you some joy. And here is the final irony. From beginning to end, Jesus believed in Peter more than Peter believed in himself. 
What a wonderful message. What a wonderful gospel. What a wonderful, wonderful God we serve. To know that in spite of all our failures, in spite of all the things that so often we regret we have done or said, God doesn't hold that against it. He just wants to make sure that you love him. And if you do love him, then do what he wants you to do. May God give us understanding to hear his word and to apply it to our lives. Let us, let us pray. Our self-giving God and Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, gave himself as a lamb to be sacrificed to bring us life. Take our lives and our gifts of our lives, and may you do with us as you will. We thank you, dear Lord, for the example of Peter, not because he denied you, but simply because in spite of his failure, he did love you, and you restored him, and you used him for your glory. We know that he became a martyr. We know that he himself was crucified upside down because he could not bear the thought of being crucified in the same way that his Savior was. And yet, he gave his life because he did love you and because he did your will. Lord, we pray that while we may not be asked of ourselves to die in such a dreadful way, nevertheless, we thank you that you called us to be faithful, obedient to you, and to live our lives for your glory. Help us, Lord, to mean the words that we love you and to reflect that love through the things that we do and say for your purposes. We thank you, Father, this morning for all the wonderful things that you give to us. Help us, dear Lord, to live accordingly to your will. And we pray, dear Lord, this morning that as we ask for your blessing upon your people, that you will bless those who need our prayers this morning. We pray, dear Lord, that you will bless our, our church. Uh, remove, dear Lord, anything, dear Father, that perhaps is not glorifying to you. But nevertheless, dear Lord, help us to bring everything to your feet and to do so with joy and with gratitude. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and sad today. We pray, dear Lord, for those, Father, who are at home feeling unwell. For those, dear Lord, who maybe feel perhaps fearful of late because their health is not good. For those who are going through treatment, for those, Father, who are indeed waiting for assaults. For those, dear Lord, who perhaps are, are fighting all kinds of illnesses, Lord, draw near to them. May you comfort them and be with them. Wherever we are discouraged, whether at work or indeed in life in general, may you grace us, dear Lord, with your grace and with your sweet holy presence. And may you lead us and guide us in all things. So hear this, Father, all our prayers. Be with us as we very shortly gather together to hear the reports of finances and property. We know that these perhaps are very material things, and yet we know that we cannot do without them. So bless our time, and may everything we do be to the glory and the honor of your name. This we ask in Jesus' name and for his dear sake. And so we come to the end of our service. We sing our final hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
peace who brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, equip us with everything good for doing his will. We go in faith in his name, restored, loved, and forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and always.